We're going to ask everybody to open up this morning to the book of Acts. We'll be in Acts chapter 4 for just a couple minutes at the beginning of this morning. We're going to be bouncing around the Bible quite a bit, but our home base will be Acts chapters 4 and 5. So go ahead and open up to that as we begin this morning. It is good to see everybody with us. We don't have a ton of visitors. We do have some visitors, though, that are with us. And so for those, we're thankful for you. We do have a lot of our number that is out. And so we want to always make sure that we keep those people in our prayers and our thoughts, as Chris prayed for this morning, for health. And those who are here, we do have some that also have been facing health issues. And it's good to have them with us. It's good that we've gotten several good reports of that. So I'm excited about that as well. Last week, if you remember, we discussed the idea of being intentional in our relationships with each other. And we talked about how we need to really kind of be investing in our relationships, important, or supporting each other, kind of building each other up and encouraging you, that type of stuff. And I think one of the things we need to talk about is that you see a great example of that in Acts, the fourth chapter. Look in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 32. So right when the early church was brand new, obviously it's an early church, so it would be brand new. But it says, the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And I think that's a, a packed verse right there. Not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For of all who were owners of land or of houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each one of us, and he had need. Verse 36, Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means sons of encouragement, and who owned a large tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. You see a lot of sharing, and you see a lot of helping each other out here, especially in this first part of Acts chapter 4. This is not the only time this happens. You see this in Acts chapter 2. But what you see there, especially, is in verse 32, when it says that they all were of one soul and of one mind, especially so that none of them had any lack. This is not a situation where somebody is just too lazy to work, and so they show up to church hoping to receive something. This is not a situation where somebody is trying to be greedy, and they say, well, I don't have as much as you, so you need to break off some of yours and give it to me. That's not the situation at all. This situation where people are looking out amongst their congregation, seeing a need, and filling that need. And Barnabas is mentioned there in those last two verses as an example of this type of stuff. The counterpoint to this argument is in chapter 5. It says, but a man named Ananias, in case you were wondering if it was all roses and sunshines, it said a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. It interjects that to make sure you know the situation. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. There's no sin so far in verse 2. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to the light of the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And then in one of the most dramatic scenes in the book of Acts, it says, as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all of those who heard of it. The young men got up and covered him up, and after carrying him out, they then buried him. Now there elapsed an interval of about three hours. And his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. Peter then said to her, why is it that you have agreed together to put the, Lord, the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear, this is the impact of this in verse 11, great fear came over all the church and over all who had heard these things. This is a really dramatic story in the book of Acts. And if you're anything like me, you've probably read that story several times, and you think to yourself, that seems a little excessive. After all, when you look at this situation, you see Ananias and Sapphira, who are doing good. They brought some of the money from the land. They gave it to the apostles' feet. They simply just lied about how much it was that they sold it for. It seems like, and I don't excuse this, it seems bordering on that white lie. We, we didn't sell it for that much, but we sold it for some. And look at what we did give. And yet the punishment for this situation is on the opposite end of the spectrum, when not only do they die, but they die instantly, and they're buried immediately. So this is a situation in which you have people who are doing otherwise some good things, and yet this really dramatic punishment comes upon them. And there have been more than one person who has looked at this story and thought to themselves, what is it that these people did? Obviously, it's kind of like a Galatians 2 situation between Paul and Peter. What is the situation here that evokes such a strong response? And moreover, how hypocritical is it of Peter, who had just denied Jesus three times, to issue a death sentence on two people 
who all we know about them is that they sinned this one time. I'm sure there was other stuff that happened. But all we know from this story is this. That's the punishment. How hypocritical is it of Peter to implement a punishment like this? What if that had happened to Peter? What if the moment that Peter denies Jesus the first time, much less the second or third, Jesus looks across the courtyard at Peter and Peter drops dead? How would Peter like that? And there have been a lot of people that have looked at this story and thought about the fact that this is a God that we're dealing with who is angry, who is vindictive, who is judgmental, who is really just out to get people. And if that's the attitude that we're battling in the world when they read passages like this, I think this story needs some explanation. And so I'll ask you this morning, what was Peter's or what was the sin of Ananias and Sapphira? When you read this story, what was your sin or what sin do you see in that? And I asked that question to several people this week, just in text messages and personal conversations back and forth. I got some sins that I never heard of before that I didn't, I didn't personally think were in there. But after some conversation on that, that kind of makes some sense. But what was interesting to me was that everybody I talked to kind of had a different spin on it. They said, well, this is something that I see. This is something I see. This is something I see. And there was never really any kind of agreement about the major sin that took place here. But there were some common denominators between what you see. For instance, a lot of people would argue the main sin that you see in Acts, the fifth chapter, is vanity. After all, this is a situation where these people who sold the land for this much came then and said, we sold it for this much, but they really only gave that much. And so they were hoping by their expression of love, they were hoping to say, well, look at how generous we are because we gave all of this. When it really, you didn't give all of it. You kept back some of it. And this is the real tragic irony of this whole story is that it wasn't like in Acts chapter 4, and that's part of why we read this, it wasn't like there was any guideline for how much these people needed to give. It was almost all, according to my understanding, a universal free will offering. Give as much as you want. Give to serve needs. Whatever it is. And yet these people tried to use this situation to exalt themselves and make themselves look better. And if that is the sin then it still seems to me like the price or the punishment is still a little excessive. After all, we do this all the time. All of us have seen people on Facebook try to make themselves look better than they actually are, primarily because they say they can bench press a certain number when you know they really can't. And so they say, look at me, I can bench press 450 pounds, look at me, and their arms are smaller than mine, which is saying something. Like, you can't really do that. And then you look on the news and you see people, politicians that are lying about what college they went to. And maybe you're a boss and you look at your resumes, you look at resumes of your employees and you see, didn't go to this college. And so this vanity kind of creeps in there to say, well, these are people that are trying to make themselves look just a little better than they actually are. What if every single time one of those situations happened, the person that did that just dropped dead right on the spot? That would be quite a dramatic situation. And yet it seems a little bit excessive. Matthew, the sixth chapter, Jesus talks about the real nature of our giving. In Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 1, and you can take this to an extreme, I understand that. But notice the principle that Jesus is preaching here. Matthew chapter 6, starting verse 1. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them, otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. In other words, your generosity should not be done to public proclaim. It's obedience without trumpets, that kind of thing. When you give to the poor, verse 2, don't sound a trumpet before you, which is, I think, a very literal thing that the, the Pharisees did. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. That's the principle in a nutshell that Ananias and Sapphira violated by this vanity clause, which is not only did they not hide it, they made sure that everyone knew as much as possible how generous they are. And most of us would look at that. We would just kind of roll our eyes at that and say, I can't believe how much they're trying to exalt themselves. This is just Ananias and Sapphira doing what Ananias and Sapphira do. Jesus doesn't take it lightly. As a matter of fact, he opens that entire clause in verse 1 by saying, if you do that, then you don't have a reward from your Father in heaven. It's the exact same principle when it comes to justice, except flipped. If you take your own justice, you're not leaving room for the wrath of God. And so we tend to try to exalt ourselves and bring ourselves up to something that's just a little bit more than what we actually are. Proverbs chapter 25 provides another good, I think, illustration of this. Proverbs chapter 25, starting in verse 6. You see this in the parable of the marriage feast. It says, Do not claim honor in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of great men, for it is better to be said to you, Come up here, 
than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. We do have a tendency sometimes to exalt ourselves and say, look at all the amazing things that I'm doing. Look at how great I am. Even if we're not being overt about it, we can do it in much more subtle ways. We call them humble brags in 2023. We can do these in slightly subtle ways. But the necessary downfall of that is that when we're trying to exalt ourselves, other people may come and say, well, you're really not that strong after all. If I claim that I can bench press 450 pounds, which I cannot, in case you were, had any doubt in your mind about my athletic accomplishments, but if I set up here and claim to be able to bench press 450 pounds, the only way to put that to the test is by putting me on a bench press and putting that bar above me. And you would see really quick, not only can I not bench it, I would probably cry when I'm underneath that. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. But sometimes when we're put to the test, we get more embarrassed than we would have been had we just stayed right there. There's a fantastic story about Ronald Reagan, which he, when he was given a speech in Mexico City one time, he gets up and he delivers this speech, and everybody just kind of sits there and stares at him, and once he gets done, everyone politely applauds. He gets down, he sits down. The next guy gets up and gives a speech 100% in Spanish. Ronald Reagan doesn't speak Spanish. But this speech is broken up every few seconds by just this thunderous applause. People are just enamored with this speech. And so Ronald Reagan, who doesn't understand Spanish, just thinks he needs to go along with it. So he starts clapping along with it. The guy next to him leans over and says, you probably shouldn't clap at this. And he says, well, why shouldn't I? He said, because he's translating your speech. And you can imagine the shame that he feels at that point. I'm not up here trying to brag on myself. I'm not up here trying to applaud myself. But sometimes that's how it becomes. And so some people would argue that the main sin that you're looking at with Ananias and Sapphira is something like this. Not that it's just this kind of innocent vanity thing, but that these people are really trying to elevate themselves to a level that God, just quite frankly, isn't, isn't up for. Somebody else would say, well, the problem with this sin, or the sin that's in view here, is this idea of greed. And I think you do see a little bit of this in the counterpoint here in Acts the fourth chapter, because... The number one accusation you can say to bring down this idea of a communal kind of church where everybody's helping each other out is, well, these are people that are just greedy. These are people that are just in it for themselves. And so it stands to reason that, at least on some level, you need to make an example out of Ananias and Sapphira so that greed doesn't become the reputation of this early church. Look in Luke, the 14th chapter. Luke does a lot, and this is... Something that I really didn't realize until I was looking at this section. But Luke does a lot when it comes to handling finances within the early church. And he obviously wrote the book of Acts. You see moments where money interjects itself into the gospel story. For instance, Demetrius the silversmith starts coming to blows with Paul whenever Paul's preaching begins to kind of take away at their business. You see in Acts the 8th chapter, you see Simon the sorcerer who tries to buy the Holy Spirit with money. You see that interjected. You also see that a little bit in Luke the 14th chapter. Starting in verse 25, listen to what he has to say here. Luke chapter 14, starting verse 25. It says, Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own wife, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own disciple and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, is not able to finish, all who observe it began to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one who is coming against him with 10,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation to ask for terms of peace. If you stop there, then the illustration is very simple. Whenever you become a Christian, whenever you think about becoming a Christian, you have to first sit down and think to yourself real quick if it's worth it. Now, logically, the answer that all of us would have, especially those of us who are Christians, is we would say, of course it's worth it. I'm giving up my physical life. I'm giving up my wants and my desires and my greed and all these other things. I'm laying all of that at the cross in order to follow Jesus. That's the attitude we should be having. But there are a lot of people who do not see it that way. There are a lot of people who come into the church and they'll say, well, I understand that all this is happening, but what is it that the church can give to me? How can you, Hillside, benefit me as a person X from Greenville? That's how some people look at it. And so the argument that he makes in verses 25 down through verse 33 is, before you come to Jesus, you need to make sure that you're willing to lose everything. Otherwise, you're going to get knee, knee deep in this thing, and you're going to realize that you have a stronger attachment to things in your life than you're probably comfortable with. 
Verse 33, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. Are you willing to do that? Verse 34, salt is good, but if salt has become tasteless, with what will it even be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Every single person that came to Jesus in Acts chapter 2 needed to be willing to, at least at this point, look at the situation and say to themselves, I am willing to lose all of it for the sake of Christ. And to a man, from what we understand, almost all of them did that, except for Ananias and Sapphira. Because when they looked at the situation, they didn't think to themselves, how can I serve the people around me? They leveraged the generosity of that local church to elevate their own position amongst other people. They used the church, in other words. When you see 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7, where it says, love does not seek its own, I think that principle applies here. Because when we talk about the love that we have as Christians, the attitude that I should have is not, how can I use you to benefit me, but how can I benefit you? What can I give up, whether that's finances, whether that's ego, whether that's time? How is it that I can use what I have to benefit you? And I and Sapphira looked at it the opposite way. And they said, how can I use this church to boost my own set of pride, my own ego, and my own standing in the company of people? Luke also addresses elsewhere in Luke, the 12th chapter, I think it is, where he says, Be on your guard, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And I, since I completely missed that. And so one of the things I think you can argue with when you look at the book of Acts is that when you make greed your fine, final foundational pillar, when that defines your life, that's anathema and absolutely opposite everything that Jesus did. Because as Jesus himself did, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve and make myself a ransom for many. So some would say, well, the situation here is that maybe they were just greedy. And obviously greed has a huge weight, especially in Luke's narrative, when you look at Luke and Acts and how he handles distribution of funds and the reputation they have. So Luke kind of focuses it on that. Maybe greed is the issue. What's interesting is that the Bible is explicit with the fact that lying is the problem. And when you look at the situation here in Acts, the fifth chapter, that's really the issue. And you can kind of negate Ananias' stance. I'm not by any means doing that, but you can kind of negate it by saying, well, when he came up and presented his gift to the people, and he said, this is how much I sold the land for, maybe he wasn't given a chance to clarify how much he actually sold the price for. So Ananias is negligible. But then four verses later, Sapphira comes along. And Peter puts her on the spot and says, tell me whether or not you sold the land for such and such a price. And she comes back and she says, that's absolutely the amount that I sold the land for. And at that moment, she dies. And so there's no question that at least partially in view in this entire story, lying is one of the major issues that takes place here. But then somebody look at this and counterpoint was saying, well, there are other times in Scripture, focusing on this, there are other times in Scripture where lying is not only not condemned, but is praised. And one of those situations that you see is here in the story of Rahab. Jump back to Judges, the second chapter. Judges chapter 2. Not only is lying not condemned, but is praised to the extent that Rahab finds herself in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So how do you reconcile this? And this is me talking as an atheist, just talking to somebody who is an enemy of God. How do you reconcile this? James the sec- or Joshua, the second chapter, starting in verse 1. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum. And he said, I have brought you, I'm sorry, I'm in Judges, not in Joshua. I don't know what Bochum had to do with anything, but you can feel free to read that if you want to on your own time. Look at Joshua 2. It says, Then Joshua the son of Nun sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go and view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came into a house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel had come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman who had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I didn't know where they were from. It came out when it was time to shut the gate of dark that the men went out. I don't know where they're at. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof, hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan as far as the fords. And as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, she shut the gates. I have read several things in this passage because this is a question that has been brought to my attention on a couple of different occasions. It is a situation that I personally have investigated because I kind of struggle to see that, especially when you see Rahab appear in Hebrews 11 and James as a model of faith. How is it possible 
that Rahab in Joshua chapter 2 is exalted for her lie, and Ananias and Sapphira are stricken dead because of theirs. Just think about that for a second. One of the things that I read when I was talking, when I was reading up on this, and I read quite a few articles about this because I wanted to see how people had approached it. I'm talking people of faith, not people who were atheistic, not people who were antagonistic. And there were quite a few people who argued for the fact that what Rahab had done was not really a lie. That she was, well, when she was misleading them, she didn't really know what it was, and, and she didn't really know who they were. And there were other people that said, well, when you look at the situation, she said that she didn't know, which is one Hebrew word, but she knew a different Hebrew word. And so there's some Hebrew issues there. I, I think those are all cop-outs. Because I think when you look at the scripture, it's very plain that Rahab knew who these men were. I think it's very plain that she misled them intentionally in order to derive them away from God. And so how do you reconcile these two points together? And I will argue a couple of things. First, when you look at this situation as it pertains to Ananias and Sapphira, there is a vast difference in between these two points. On the first hand, Rahab did absolutely nothing in this lie to benefit herself. Can you imagine what Rahab would have been exalted to? If those spies had come in, and this is a woman who lives in the walls of Jericho, most likely poor. She's not a person who has a lot of good standing in the city. She would have been exalted and been given riches to the moon. If she had said, yeah, I remember those guys from Israelites. They're actually in this back room over here. She would have been blessed to the moon for ratting them out. And so Rahab stands against Jericho. The people that inquired about them benefited her in zero way. And I, and Sapphira absolutely did. And this is where I think you see a little bit of the difference between these lies that Rahab had and I, and Sapphira alongside people like the Hebrew midwives in Exodus chapter 2 who hid the Israelite boy babies because they knew that Pharaoh's men were coming after them. This is what you see with the people hiding the Jews in Nazi Germany in 1940. It's what you see with people who were liberators in the 1860s hiding slaves in the Underground Railroad. How do you justify those lies? Well, they did so with the potential at great expense to themselves and virtually no benefit to themselves with that lie. I think that's one of the big differences. Ananias and Sapphira lied primarily to save themselves. But I think you also see something else. Look in verse 7 of Joshua chapter 2, or verse 8 rather. It says, Now before they lay down and came up to the men on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. What you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage reigned in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, verse 12. Please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's household. Give me a pledge of truth. Spare my father, my mother, my brother, my sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. So the men said to her, I lie for yours if you do not tell us this business of ours. And it shall come about that when the Lord gives us the land, that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. There is some benefit that Rahab derives from this, but it is almost universally dependent on the fact of faith in God. And that's really the issue here in play. When you look at how Rahab continues this conversation with the, the Israelites, she says a number of things in those first three verses. Number one, she knows what the God of Israel is capable of. And she says, number two, we know that when you come in here, that everybody here is going to be scared out of their minds because we've all heard of it. Number three, I want to throw my lot in with you guys. Your God is my God in a sense. I want to be what you are. I want to be a part of your people. And you see that in the lineage of Jesus that Rahab appears inside the lineage of Jesus. And so Rahab, despite living in Jericho, has thrown her hat firmly in the ring of God. But notice what she's scared of there in verses 8 through 14. I want to be a part of your group because I don't want to be going against your God. I don't want to be found to be fighting against God, which is exactly, we're going to get this in just a second, but this is exactly what Ananias and Sapphira did. When you see the, with the, see the statement in Acts, the fifth chapter, that Peter makes towards Ananias and Sapphira, he says, why have you decided not only to lie to God, but you've also been found to fight against God? You're doing this right now, this action, in opposite of what God asks you to do. And so somebody that would ask me about this situation between Rahab and Ananias, those are the two things I would talk about. Number one, Rahab's lie was done ultimately to achieve a good. There's a hospitality element to it. She derived no benefit to herself in contrast to Ananias and Sapphira. 
But second of all, the major concern in her mind was my whole wife, everything that I'm about to do is not going to be found in contest with Jehovah. And that's the other issue, the thing that I would say back to that. Conveniently, you see the opposite of that in Joshua, the seventh chapter. Joshua chapter 7, starting in verse 16. This is the story of Achan. It's one of the only significant losses that the Israelites would have as they tried to take Canaan. And in Joshua chapter 7, starting in verse 16, it says, Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near by the tribes. This is after Achan is in the first 15 verses, that whole story. It's going to repeat in these verses. And it says, he brought the family of Judah near, and he took the family of the Zerahites. He brought the family of the Zerahites near man by man. Zabdi was taken. Brought his household near man by man. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, was taken. There's something happening. We need to find out what it is. Verse 19, Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel. Give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Don't hide it from me. Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. That's opposite of what Rahab did. That's exactly, though, what Ananias and Sapphira did. In stealing things, as he talks about in the first few verses of this chapter, stealing things that were under the ban is equated as fighting against God. That's what you see there in verse 19 and verse 20. He says in verse 21, When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. This is a fantastic counterpoint or a fantastic parallel with what you see in Acts the fifth chapter. In, Acts chapter, or in Joshua chapter 7, what you have is Achan, who in his pursuit of this battle and his victory of the battle, takes something that is expressly forbidden of him, this Babylonian garment. probably looks great on him. But he takes it because it's worth its weight in silver. He's greedy about it. Takes it, hides it under its tent, and within a matter of days after that, they fight the battle of Ai, and several people die. I think it's dozens of the Israelites die. And they're looking, what caused this? What was Achan? Who not only did something to benefit himself, but also by his own omission, did so knowing that he would fight against God. I didn't sin against you. I sinned against God. That's the difference that's happening there. And Ananias and Sapphira is the same situation. They leverage the situation in order to build themselves up by keeping what was by their own admission, not theirs. It could have been. They could have kept it. Nobody would have minded. But in trying to elevate themselves, they tried to take ego and, air and, and status that wasn't theirs. So I think you can make a strong point that lying is the problem with Ananias and Sapphira. Number four, testing God. Acts the fifth chapter in verse nine, if you want to read this, it literally says, why have you decided together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? This is a passage that comes up every once in a while. And oftentimes when we read this passage about testing God, we ask ourselves, well, why is it that this is such a big deal? Because after all, if you look, and we don't have time to read it right now, but if you look in Matthew four, verses five through seven, you have the temptation of Jesus. And in the second temptation, when he says, I Make, Satan says to Jesus, make these stones become bread. Jesus answers by saying the exact phrase, why would you put the Lord your God to the test? And so we ask ourselves when we read that, what does that mean, putting God to the test? And then our minds drift to situations like Massa and Meribah, where you remember at the waters or with these rocks and the Israelite wanderings where Moses says, shall I draw water from you from this rock? And they hit the rock and water comes out. The precursor to both of those situations is the people demanding that God feed them. Did you bring us out of the wilderness to die of thirst? Did you bring us out of the wilderness to die of, of hunger? Did you do all these things so that we would die out here? The way that they're putting God to test is they're questioning his goodwill. Is he actually capable of this, number one? And number two, is he actually willing to do that type of stuff? They're testing God's love rather than embracing it. And here, in Matthew, and here in Acts, the fifth chapter, the same exact type of thing is happening. They're looking at God in the eye and they're saying, well, I know we're lying about this situation. I know it's not all the money, but who's really going to tell? Who really cares? God cares. And the people that they're stealing from care. So why have you decided to test God's omniscience by thinking he's not going to know? Did Achan really think that hiding a Babylonian garment under his tent would make it invisible to God? When my dog does something bad, he goes and hides in the corner. I still see him. Yeah, people do that today. Do we really think that we can hide from God? Do we really think that our sins won't find us out? In Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 6, 
Paul uses this, I think, as an exhortative, as a positive thing. But the flip side is present as well. Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 6, says, The one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Don't be deceived. God isn't mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he's also going to reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people. And especially to those who are of the household of faith. If you do good things in the service of God, if you serve Him, if you obey Him, if you do what He asks you to do, all of those things are visible to Him. And sometimes we think to ourselves, well, God doesn't see this because it happened online. Or we think, well, God doesn't see that I donated this money because it went through GoFundMe and I clicked anonymous. And so God's not going to see it. And because God's not going to see it, he's not going to know that I'm, I'm loyal to him. And that discourages me. And so the admonition of Galatians chapter 6 is, whatever you sow, you're also going to reap that in a good way or in a negative way. You can't put God to the test by saying that I'm going to do something and then hoping to achieve the opposite result, hoping to achieve the opposite result. That's completely backwards. You see this on the flip side when God looks at Abraham and asks Abraham to give his only son on the altar towards him. It specifically says that God is testing him. The reason that God can test him in that instance is because he wants to know in that hour of the most extreme sacrifice, what is Abraham going to do? He knows what he's going to do. But he wants Abraham to prove it through his actions. Abraham intervenes. How dare any of us try that with God? And look at God and say, well, God's never going to know what I did. Because after all, he's over there, he's there. I can do this and expect this result. It doesn't work like that. And when you look at Acts the 5th chapter and verse 9, that's really hyper-specifically what is in view. When Peter looks at him and he says, why have you decided together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Why is it that you thought you could do this and get away with it? And verse 11 gives the ramifications of that. When they thought they could hide something from God and they died instantly, great fear spread throughout the church. You can't hide anything from God. You can't put him to the test by thinking, well, I don't really know how he's going to act. You know how he's going to act. I know how he's going to act. Let us not be fools in thinking that we can test God's hand to do differently than how he already has been or how he's already promised us. But the opposite of that is true as well. If we're loyal to him and follow him, if we serve him, if we're friends of his, if we obey him, if all those things that encompasses that healthy relationship, he's not going to ignore that. And you may think that you labor in obscurity, that nobody sees you, that nobody sees that time you took with that person. That nobody sees that prayer, prayer that you had a couple days ago where you were on your knees crying because you needed strength. You may think that God doesn't see that. And God does see that. Don't put God to the test by thinking he's, he, he's blind to your actions. What he asks for us is full and total submission. He asks for a heart. I ask you to give that to him as we stand and as we sing.